God loves the world. He wants everyone to be saved. He cares so much about you and me that he sends his angels to warn us ahead of time. In Revelation 14 verses 6 to 12, we read about the messages of three angels. The one is as important as the other. Our eternal destination depends on how we respond to these messages. Listen with all your attention as Francois explains to us what the three angels are saying. Let's visit some of the finest places of worship before listening to the messages of the three angels of Revelation chapter 14. When Constantinople, that's modern Istanbul, fell into the hands of the Ottoman Turks in AD 1453, Hagia Sophia, a Christian church, was converted into a mosque and four minarets were added. Not far from the Hagia Sophia is the Blue Mosque. Don't you think it's impressive? Have you ever asked yourself the question, why do people worship? Just look at this beautiful column head. How does the place and object of worship affect my spiritual life? Does it make a difference where I worship? Maybe some of you will recognize this vaulting nave. It's Westminster Abbey in London. God has placed within man a strong desire to worship. The devil knows it and he will continually try to pervert our need to worship. In this lecture we are going to look at the right and wrong ways of worshipping God. Why? Because the last great crisis will center on the manner of worship. In a previous lecture on Revelation 7, we looked at the ceiling of the 144,000 just before Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It is such an important message that it is imperative that we know exactly who the sealed are and what the seal is. Let's read from Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Now what is the meaning of wind? Well, it's war, strife, calamity. Right now angels are holding back the winds of destruction which the devil wants to let loose. Why are the angels holding back the winds of strife? Because God wants to seal his children with the seal of the living God. Verses 2 to 4 Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. In a previous lecture we discovered that a seal is a mark or a sign of authority and is being used by rulers and officials to make laws and agreements valid. It contains the name, the title and the territory of the lawgiver. Archaeology also tells us that the ancient seals indicated ownership as well as protection. And this conveys the beautiful message that when God puts his seal on me, I am his special property and that he will protect me in these last days. In Isaiah 8.16, the Lord says that the law must be sealed among his disciples. In other words, I will find the seal in the law of God. Hebrews 8.10 says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Which one of the Ten Commandments contains the three characteristics of the seal? But in order to receive the seal of God, I must realize that it is much more than just an outward observance of the seventh day of the week. Sabbath observance must also reflect the character of the Lord of the Sabbath. And this is exactly what Revelation 14 verse 1 tells us. Let's read it. Then I looked and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. By comparing chapter 7 and 14, we discover that the seal and the name of God are synonymous. In other words, the 144,000 are Sabbath-keeping people who reflect the name or character of God. 
Do you think the devil wants you and me to be saved? Of course not. And for this very reason he will try and destroy and discredit the Sabbath, which is the symbol of God's sealing grace. He will deter us from keeping the Sabbath and thereby developing a Christ-like character. And in order to challenge and destroy the validity and the message of the Sabbath, the enemy developed his own seal or mark. Revelation 13 calls it the mark of the beast. Sunday, the false day of worship, stands in opposition to the Sabbath which contains the seal of God. When you study the history of the change from Sabbath to Sunday, you discover that a very shrewd and clever enemy is behind it. He has brainwashed the entire world on this issue, as we've discovered already. Do you think God is going to leave the inhabitants of this planet in ignorance concerning the deception of the devil? Is he going to expose the false day of worship universally? Yes. Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12 is God's final warning to this world of what is coming. Everyone will be exposed to the facts and then decide whether to follow God or man. Amos 3, 7 Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. When the antediluvians, people who lived before the flood, became extremely wicked and polluted the earth, God had to purify this planet through a worldwide flood. Did he warn the antediluvians about his intentions to destroy the planet? Yes, Genesis 6, 3 says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, his days will be a hundred and twenty years. For 120 years, Noah preached that a flood would destroy this world. God gave everyone an opportunity to repent and be saved. The majority rejected the prophetic message of Noah and died in the flood. Luke 17 verses 26, 27 and 30 says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It will be like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. May God help us to discern the signs of the times. More and more articles are being published threatening people with punishment if they desecrate the Papal Sunday. There was a prophetic message prior to the flood and there will again be a prophetic message just before Jesus comes a second time. If you look very carefully, you will see the name Ein Karem on this street pole in Jerusalem. It's the name of a little village just outside Jerusalem where John the Baptist grew up. When I visited here, I thought of how God tells us ahead of time what's going to happen. What a considerate saviour. The angel Gabriel who appeared to both Daniel and John also appeared to Zechariah and told him that he would be the father of the forerunner of the Messiah. Long before the birth of John the Baptist, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 40 verse 3 telling us exactly what kind of prophetic message he would preach. A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Let's go to the Jordan River where John the Baptist preached and baptized people and listened to his prophetic message. Matthew 3 verses 1 to 3 In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John preached a Christ-centered message, a prophetic message. He called people to repent and break off with their sins. John the Baptist, like Noah, preached present truth. Inside the modern church at Ein Karem, the tourist can visit the ancient well from the days of John the Baptist. As I looked at it, I thought of the clear prophetic waters that this mighty preacher gave his audience to drink. And when I left that church, I also thought of the clear prophetic waters the remnant church will offer the world before Jesus comes a second time. 
In Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12, we read about the messages of three angels. They represent the proclamation by God's remnant church of a message that will bring a full and final restoration of the gospel truth. These final messages contain God's answer to the overwhelming satanic deceptions that must lead the world at this time, just before Christ's return. Immediately after the world had listened to this message, Christ returns to reap the harvest, similar to this harvest scene in Galilee. Let's read about it in Revelation 14.14. 14. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one, like the Son of Man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. May the Holy Spirit be with us as we listen to God's final appeal to worship Him and Him alone. I'm going to read the messages of the three angels prayerfully. Please listen to every word attentively. This is the last message to the world. Acceptance thereof means life. Rejection thereof means death. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says, Then I saw another angel flying in mid-air, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The first angel symbolizes the messengers of God's last church on earth. They proclaim the eternal gospel, telling us sinners that we can be justified by faith and receive Christ's righteousness. But the remnant, represented by the first angel, also proclaims that the gospel is eternal. It was not introduced when Christ died on the cross, but at the time when Adam and Eve sinned. Take for example David. He sinned deeply and he repented deeply after the prophet Nathan spoke to him. Listen to his beautiful words of repentance. Psalms 32 verses 1 and 2 Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. How was David saved? By works or by grace? I am so grateful that the first angel's message contains the good news of the gospel. Only when one accepts this good news is he able to listen to the rest of the messages. Have you fully accepted the fact that Jesus died on the cross in order to save you? If not, I would like to invite you to do so. It brings unbelievable peace. By the way, if anybody tells you that people in the Old Testament times were saved through good deeds or obedience, don't believe it. The first angel says that the gospel is everlasting. God's method of saving people is unchangeable. Another point to remember is the fact that the first angel preaches a global message. It is not a local church or a national church, but a worldwide movement. Do you know of such a movement? Revelation 14.7 He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Fear Him, glorify Him, and worship Him. Why? Because we live in the serious times of the investigative judgment. How do we glorify God? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31 So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The first angel's message teaches people to adopt a healthy lifestyle. Do you know about a worldwide church which has a health message? They are the remnant. Daniel and his three friends refused to defile themselves with the unhealthy food of Babylon. Daniel is a type of the end-time Daniels who will glorify God by adopting a healthy lifestyle. The first angel's message appeals to the world to glorify God in their bodies, that is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Ask God for self-control and cultivate a new healthy lifestyle. 
Revelation 14, 7, he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Tell me, when did judgment begin? John is referring to Daniel chapter 8 where it says that Christ began the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary in 1844. At this specific time he ended upon his work of judgment during the last phase of his high priestly ministry. The first angel announces to the world that the hour of God's judgment has come and because of the lateness of the hour we are called upon to live holy lives which will reflect the image of God. Do you know about a church that proclaims a judgment hour message? In Revelation 13 there is a call to worship the beast and his image and millions respond. But a small minority will refuse to worship the beast and receive his mark. Why? Because they heed the call of God through the first angel's message. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now where did John get his vocabulary from? He gets us from Exodus 20 verse 11 where it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In contrast to the call to worship the beast, God calls man to worship him by observing his Sabbath. Have you heard of a worldwide church that worships God on the Sabbath? Let's look at the way Cain and Abel worshipped God. What was God's requirement for true worship in those days? Well, it was offering a lamb. Abel obeyed and his worship was accepted. Cain decided to bring fruit, the labour of his hand, and God rejected his manner of worship. God's requirement for worship has not changed. Let's worship him according to the way he wants us to worship him. Soon everyone will have to make a choice between true and false worship like Cain and Abel did. Between worshipping God on his terms, that is righteousness by faith and bringing a lamb, or bringing a human sacrifice which is righteousness by works. While the theory of evolution denies God's creatorship, the first angel calls us to worship him by keeping his Sabbath holy. The Sabbath is God's safeguard against the dangerous theory of evolution because it acknowledges him as the only creator. Today there is only one major worldwide church that still believes and preaches the creation story. You have listened to the message of the first angel. You have heard the appeal to worship God on his terms and give him glory. I pray that you will respond to this message with all your heart like many millions all over the world. Revelation 14.8 A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. From ancient times, literal Babylon symbolized defiance of God. Can we also expect mystical Babylon to defy God? Yes, Genesis 11, 1-9 tells us that Babylon's tower was a monument of apostasy and a center of rebellion. When you read Isaiah 14, you notice that Satan was its invisible king and it appears that he wanted to make Babylon the agency of his master plan for ruling the human race. In my research, I made a very interesting discovery concerning the powerful influence of the Babylonian religion on the Assyrians. In spite of the fact that the Assyrians were ruling the world before 612 BC, they worshipped the superior Babylonian gods. Throughout the ages, Babylon was a kind of a Vatican. The ancient world regarded their way of worship as superior to all the other forms of worship. During the early Christian centuries, Jewish and Christian literature referred to the city of Rome as Babylon. So does 1 Peter 5.13. The more you study the use of the term Babylon, the more you realize that John is referring to Rome as an apostate system, the fallen Babylon.
Because of the apostasy of the Church of Rome, most Protestants of the Reformation and post-Reformation era refer to it as spiritual Babylon, the great enemy of God's people. In Revelation 17.5, we read a description of the woman on the beast. It says, This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I made a very interesting discovery at St. John Lateran in Rome. Let's walk a little closer. I'm pointing to a huge Latin inscription which reminds one of the words of Revelation 17.5. I'm going to translate the Latin into English. Sacred Lateran Church. The rest says, Church Mother and Head of all the churches of the city and the world. When I visited the reconstructed Ishtar Gate of Babylon, I thought of the appropriate name John used to describe the papacy, namely Babylon. Just as ancient Babylon has fallen, so too has mystic Babylon fallen, says the second angel. Tell me, who do you think are the daughters of Rome? Well, it's all those churches who follow her false teachings. Isaiah 51.26 says that ancient Babylon would become desolate forever. And this also applies to mystic Babylon. There is no future for Babylon or its adherents. Revelation 14.8 A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. One refers to Rome's false teachings. For instance, the entire world believes that the Antichrist has come, preterism, or that he still is coming, futurism. This is the wine, the false doctrine from two Jesuit priests, Alcazar and Ribera. I have shocking news for you. Apostate Protestantism has fallen and become part of Babylon. I'll tell you why. They drank of the wine of false Catholic doctrine. There was a time when the Protestant world had the courage to say that the little horn of Daniel 7 is the papacy, the Antichrist. But today they are silent. There was a time when Protestants believed that God created the earth in six literal days. But now most of them adopted the theory of evolution like Rome. The drinking of this Roman wine caused their fall. The majority of Protestant churches have rejected the flood and creation accounts as recorded in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, calling them myths. How sad. They drank Babylonian wine, became intoxicated and fell. When the wonderful truth of God's holy Sabbath was brought to the Protestant world and its leaders, they rejected it and clung to the tradition of Sunday worship. And through the ages, the churches of the world kept rejecting the truth of God's Sabbath. Oh, how very sad. Babylon, the great apostate religious system has fallen, has fallen. The devil laughs and God cries. You are listening to the solemn and serious message of the second angel which says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And as the angel makes his announcement, he weeps because he is very sad. But God has a special invitation for his honest, sincere children in Babylon. God does not want his sincere, honest children to remain in this fallen Babylonian state. Listen to his earnest appeal in Revelation 18.4. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Babylon falls because she rejects the first angel's message. If you and I accept the message of worshipping God in the way he specifies, we will be saved. But if we reject the first angel's message and worship the beast, then we too will fall with the beast, with Babylon. Revelation 14, 9-11 A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. 
He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. Nowhere in the entire Bible, from Genesis to the book of Revelation, will you find a more serious warning. Throughout all the ages, God pled with sinners, calling them to repentance. But this is his final warning, his last call, and he wants to impress the world with the seriousness of this end-time message. Let us have a careful and prayerful look at this serious warning. It is a warning against worshipping the beast and his image. All who reject the gospel of righteousness by faith will ultimately worship the beast. Because of the serious nature of this message, it will be good for us to do a little review. The first beast, described in Revelation 13, 1-10, is the papacy, a church-state union that dominated the Christian world for so many centuries. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul calls him the man of sin. In Daniel chapter 7, he is called the little horn, and the prophet gives us ten characteristics to help us make a correct identification of the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 8, he is again called the little horn. He dominated the world and persecuted God's people for 1,260 years. All these references point to the papacy. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate religion that will be developed when churches, having lost the true spirit of the Reformation, shall unite with the state to enforce their teachings on others, especially Sunday observance. The Protestant churches of America will be leaders in uniting church and state and thus become a perfect image to the beast. The devil will inspire all Protestants to become religiously intolerant so that they will look exactly like the apostate church, the first beast, which persecuted for 1,260 years. The third angel's message proclaims the most solemn and fearful warning in the entire Bible. It reveals that those who submit to human authority in earth's final crisis will worship the beast and his image rather than God. The truth of God's Sabbath will be clearly brought before the world, and those who reject God's memorial of creatorship, choosing to worship and honor Sunday, knowing that it is not God's appointed day of worship, will receive the mark of the beast. This mark is a mark of rebellion. Why? Because the beast claims that he has authority over the law of God. The third angel's message directs the world's attention to the consequences of refusing to accept the everlasting gospel and God's message of the restoration of true worship. What are these consequences? Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Disobedience means self-destruction. Revelation 14.12 This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Very soon every person will have to make a choice. If I seek justification through the works of man and not by faith that comes through a total surrender to God, I'm lost. I may escape persecution from the beast, but I will receive the punishment of the seven last plagues. On the other hand, if I make a full surrender to God and follow him in total dependence, I will be saved. What a day it will be when Jesus comes and you and I are ready to go home with him. It takes some agonizing to make a full surrender. But just think of the eternity of happiness and peace and security we will eventually enjoy. My prayer for you is to spend an eternity with Christ. Thank you, Francois. Every time I listen to the messages of Revelation 14, 
I realize how important they are. Let us pray. Our wonderful and loving Savior, thank you, Jesus, for the messages of the three angels. You send the angels because you love us and want us to be saved. Please help us not to ignore them, but to do your will and follow heaven's advice as it will give us peace of mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.